For the sake of completion, I want to very quickly mention two sections of Young and Friedman's University Physics, Chapter 12. This chapter is on gravitation. Um, sections 12.6 and 12.7 are asterisked sections, which means that they're somewhat optional uh, when it comes to you know whether or not a professor um, will assign them or a student needs to, to know them necessarily. So, but let me quickly mention them. Uh, so 12.6 is basically where uh, Young and Friedman proved something that they assumed earlier on in the chapter on gravitation. And it's basically this. This section proves that the gravitational interaction between two spherically symmetrical uh, mass distributions, that the gravitational interaction between those two spherically symmetrical mass distributions is the same as if they were both two points at the center of each. Um, they've assumed this, but uh, because they're good uh, mathematicians and scientists, they want to prove it. And so here are basically the steps. Uh, if, if somebody in the wild world wants me to do a video going through the proof, I can do that. Uh, but I, I figure most students don't need to know this. Probably very few students need to know this. Um, but here, so here are the steps of proving that if you have two spheres uh, with gravitational attraction toward each other, you can treat them as if they're two points at the center of each um, doing gravitational uh, tor force toward each other. Here's how they prove it. So they start with assuming that we have a, a sphere and they, they look at one shell, just one shell of that sphere in relation to a point that's outside that one little shell. And basically they start by showing that the potential energy of the interaction between a shell of a sphere and a point outside of it is the same as if as if all the mass of, of this uh, shell were concentrated in the middle of the sphere. Well, since you can basically consider uh, a sphere to be a, uh, an infinite number of shells, as it were, um, then you can basically say that if for any shell on that mass, um, it's the same as if the mass was uh, in the center, then you can, ex by extension, say that the mass of an entire sphere, solid sphere, is the sa can be treated the same in terms of gravitational force as if all the mass were at the center. Um, now, um, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So they start by showing the potential energy. Well, force is the negative derivative of potential energy. This is from a previous chapter. And so that means that what applies for potential energy that uh, for, for purposes of, of potential energy, you can treat the sphere as if all the potential energy were at a point in the center. You can also treat as if the force is all at the center, um, what I said earlier. Now, what is true of one shell is, is true of two shells. So if you can say that this sphere over here, its mass and gravity can be treated as if it's all at the center, then you can say that for this sphere over here. It's as if all of it's at the center, and thus we have... Um, the implication that um, the gravitational force on, on a map, let me go back, that the, the gravitational force between two spheres is the same as the gravitational po uh, force would be of two points at the center of those two spheres. Um, they just proved this. They've assumed this throughout the chapter, now they've proved it. So basically, if the sun had a, uni the sun probably doesn't have a uniform, it doesn't have a uniform uh, mass distribution, but if you, you could, in theory, treat, well, you can treat the sun as if it's a point at its very center with all of its mass in terms of gravitation. Um, at the very end of this section, they show that if we were to go in, if we were to take a journey to the center of the earth, that as we go down into the center of the earth, the gravitational force on us, you can ignore the part of the earth that we've covered going down. Basically, the gravitational force on us is going to depend on how far we are from the center of the earth. So basically, if you could get to the center of the earth and you can't, we would be weightless at the center of the earth because there would be zero radius. Um, so the farther the farther you go out from the center of the earth, the gravitational, you know, it increases in, in relation to the square of the radius. Um, so um, basically, the further you go in, only the radius from the center is what counts as far as how much gravity. So if you were, if you were to go halfway toward the center of the earth, then gravity would be um, half the radius. It would be one-fourth of what it is now, r squared. Okay, so that's basically section 
uh, 12.6. It basically proves something uh, that we've already assumed earlier on um, in the book. Okay, so again, not, not really necessary unless you want to teach this stuff or, or unless you just like it. Okay, chapter 12, uh, section 7 is a little bit more uh, significant. Although the basic point is to make a distinction between true weight and apparent weight. So the true weight is the weight that you would have if the Earth wasn't rotating. Um, uh, it's, for example, if you were at the North or South Pole, it's the weight you would experience there. So it's basically going to be the, our, your mass uh, times 9.8, the, you know, the, the acceleration of gravity at uh, 9.8 meters per second squared. So that's what you're going to experience at the poles. That's your true weight. Um, and it just follows basically, so uh, W0 uh, represents your true weight. And it's basically just going to be Newton's gravitational uh, equation, um, substituting in the mass of the Earth and the radius of the Earth for uh, one of the masses and for, one of the rad and for the radius. So that's pr fairly straightforward. Your true weight, what you would experience if you were at the North or South Pole and weren't, in effect, rotating. Now, because most of us don't live at the North Pole, um, or at the bottom of Antarctica, um, our weight is a, a little bit less than uh, our true weight because of, of the alleviating force of the Earth's rotation. Um, I was thinking this morning, uh, this morning I took out a, cow, uh, a chair for bulk pickup. And, you know, it was a, you know, I'm, I'm getting old. It was a somewhat heavy chair. And so I kind of swing... Is that, is that the right word? I, I swang the, the chair a little bit back and forth um, to keep, to lighten the weight, as, as it were. So that pendulum motion, you know, somewhat alleviated, you know, a, a little bit of a circle, tiny bit of an arc, um, alleviated the weight uh, of, of that chair. Well, anyway, um, as it were, when, when something is rotating, um, the kind of spin force, torque, as it were, um, it alleviates the downward force a little bit. So, basically, our true weight minus that that force um, is our, our, our apparent weight. It's an, our, our apparent weight, and our apparent weight is going to be a little bit less uh, than our true weight. Now, he does a little algebra. Uh, he divides both sides by uh, m and uh, of, of equations that have already been established. Again, I, I didn't think it was important to go into all the proof of how he gets here. But he ends up basically uh, with an equation that says that the true weight minus the force of, you know, that has to do with the rotation um, is going to equal the mass times the velocity squared divided by, say, the radius of the Earth if you're standing on the surface of the Earth. So basically, if you were at the equator, so this is the largest deviation. You're going to experience the most spin at the equator. And so um, there is a deviation between the, the true gravitational uh, acceleration, 9.8, and the apparent gravitational acceleration. Uh, there's going to be a slight difference at the equator uh, by plugging in the numbers here, plugging in the velocity of the Earth, plugging in the, the radius of the Earth. So basically, the gravitational acceleration uh, is 0 0.0339 meters per second square less uh, than it is at the North Pole because of the rotation of the Earth. And he gives a chart, he gives a chart basically that shows various places and how the acceleration is a little bit less. So for example, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, um, 9.801 is what the gravitational constant is, but uh, in Jamaica, it's 9.78. So the gravitational constant changes just a little bit uh, depending on uh, various uh, factors. Um, okay, that's what this section's about. Um, in orbit, uh, because you're in a perfect balance between the force of the Earth and the the force uh, of the of the the tangent going you know going around the Earth, um, they cancel each other out. And so that's why you have apparent weightlessness uh, when you're in orbit, uh, because the force of your um, rotation and the force of the uh, gravity uh, caused by gravity are going to cancel each other out. Well, um, 
Again, I'm not sure how much of this you really need to know. Uh, I think I've uh, given you the main points. The main points to know from this section are that because of the Earth's rotation, our weight is usually a little bit less, although you can see that maybe not in every case, but our weight is usually a little bit less uh, than our actual true weight if the Earth weren't rotating. Um, and um, that uh, you can look up on a chart exactly what uh, the acceleration due to gravity is at, at a particular point. Okay, well this has been uh, a couple sections in Young and Friedman's University Physics.